started. On behalf of the Shelter Island Public Library, we welcome you to this evening's Friday Night Dialogue with author Josh Sabin. Josh is here to talk about his new book, The Third Act, and he has brought a couple of friends with him so that they can assist with this presentation. So, Great. not here to hear me, so welcome to Josh. Thank you guys all for coming out. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. yeah great. Well, thank you. Um, I know so many of you, so I could actually thank you individually. We could kill the hour and go home and go drinking, um, which could be a good Friday night on Shelter Island. Um, so I'd like to introduce the people who I'm here with who are all living on Shelter Island and who have uh, lives that I think are worth hearing about. Um, uh, Susan Carey Dempsey has been, in her earlier life, a strategic advisor to not-for-profits, advocacy groups, and political campaigns. Uh, she's been editor-in-chief of national publications. Uh, I was introduced to Susan uh, by reading The Shelter Island Reporter, where she's a journalist. And um, I so fell a little bit in love with the manner in which she wrote. And if you're familiar with it, I'm sorry to have a television analog for writing, but it felt a little bit like a local Charles Kowalt. Because <laughs> she, it was less the facts and more, if I can say it, the community, humanity, and a little bit the poetry. So I thought it would be wonderful to have her to speak to, um, and that's Susan. So I'll ask you to hold your applause, I guess. Uh, until I introduce the other. Oh, well, we can go each time. Susan, yeah! Give it up for Susan. Um, uh, Joshua Potter, some of you may know because he may have had his hands up your clothing. Uh, in an entirely appropriate, if not imperative way. And uh, if you don't know, he grew up in the Texas Hill Country in a town, um, are you allowed to curse here in the library? Nah. In a town, no kidding, called Utopia. Um, and he did spend his childhood uh, wandering the hills and reading Byron, Yeats, and Tolkien. And he then got a master's degree in English, and he was an English teacher, which was sort of act one for Joshua Potter. Uh, I met him in act two as a doctor during COVID. I went to him, and he treated me for the things I had and the things that I imagined I had. He was pretty good <laughs> at the imaginary diseases uh, and very good at the real ones. And he's right down 114 if you haven't encountered him. And I met him and it was actually, you know, I'm sort of, they're merging the meetings, but he, at one meeting, he had come from an all night shift at Southampton Hospital, which he does voluntarily. And then he paid attention to me like there was nothing else in the world and had abundant time to talk about uh, my biology and my psychology. And <laughs> <laughs> only later, actually, did I discover that he is really a, and, and I don't know how, if I'm a judge, but I'm a lifelong admirer of poets, an absolutely extraordinary poet. And so he is English teacher, Dr. Poet. And the poetry is just, uh, 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 you, you'll, you'll encounter it at some point. For yourself. And, um, and the third person here in the middle is Bill Persky. Bill, if you don't know him, is the son of an itinerant, I think that's the right word, Bill, uh, auctioneer, um, which brought this then New York kid uh, to elementary <laughs> school in Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, before working as a lifeguard in the Borscht Belt in the Catskill Mountains. Um, that's actually in evidence in his background, in his current. Uh, personality, but the Arkansas thing seems deeply buried. I can't find it anywhere. So Actually, anyway, Bill, it's the same school that Bill Clinton went to, oh. not at the same time. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I have to interrupt my own intro and say, because you, I know what the one time you met President Bill Clinton and yes. said, then you, do you mind just saying, no, I, hey, hold, the mic to, hold the mic up so everyone can hear Bill. Sorry. You can hear me well. <laughs> it, uh, I, was, I went to a fundraiser in New York for Clinton, and there was this big mosh about meeting him. And, you know, at the end of the speech and everything, there were thousands of people. And politicians are really 
great at going through a crowd. They're like a snake. Their hand goes out with their eye to you, and before they get there, they're on to you. And before they get there, they're on to the next person, and you're shaking hands with you and smiling at him. And so I was just there in the crowd, and as he came to me and shook my hand, and as he started to look away, I said, I went to Ramble Street School. And he said, no, stop, Ramble, my God, he went to Ramble Street School. He never, in the middle of New York. And uh, I, I was, I was uh, the first Jewish person ever in Ramble Street School. And literally, they fell for my horns. And they either started beating me up because I didn't have them, or they just were going to do that anyway. But, they did it in Madison, Wisconsin in the 60s. <laughs> I actually was there. We should, I know. We should talk after, as they say. So, so if you don't know, Bill um, found his way to radio in New York City and then television, moving to California in the 60s to write for Steve Allen, the Steve Allen Show, and then work with his lifelong friend, Carl Reiner. Um, on the Dick Van Dyke show and there he wrote and I've worked in the television business and there are TV episodes that are considered the best of all time. I mean the the best of all time uh, Coast to Coast Big Mouth you can name these episodes and the world goes <gasps> And anyway Bill wrote so many of those like breathtaking like total Shakespearean television classics <laughs> They're just <laughs> insane and he went on to develop and produce TV series that if there's a notable theme, they put women in independent, powerful roles, including that girl and Kate and Alley, and along the way, he won a, a whole basket of Emmy Awards. Um, and he is one of my best friends, so um, I can tell you that he's, as you may have just witnessed, funnier in person than his TV shows are, and nicer and more generous than he is funny. So it's just- I would thing. take a bow, but I fall. <laughs> So I have questions to ask, and actually, if I could ask, um, generally, when I start to speak, two and a half hours pass, so if anyone can scream when we're near eight o'clock, that would be helpful. Um, so, um, so Joshua, can I ask you about um, Texas, and about uh, reading, and about wandering, and about being an English teacher, and then becoming a doctor? because the book's sort of about stages and chapters, and you're too young to have three acts, but you really do. You know, I don't know, you may be on your way to nine. I can't keep a job. That's probably not wrong. So, so do you mind a little bit? Because it's a fun... As long as I don't have to talk about politics in Texas, then we're good. <laughs> not in one hour. <laughs> not in one day. Um, do know many of you, this is true. So, but I'm short, so if I can't see them in the back, I apologize. Uh, yeah, so I grew up, those of you who, I, obviously for privacy reasons, I'm gonna not look at anybody in the eyes as I say this, those of you who I had the good fortune to see in the office and have heard me ramble, I like to talk about how Shelter Island is very much like where I grew up. And I, Utopia is a real place, um, believe it or not. And uh, it's a small town with no stoplights, um, one general store, one gas station, one school, K through 12, from which I graduated in class of 11. Um, after starting with six in my class in first grade, so we almost doubled. That's something prodigal to be proud of. And about, I, it feels like 15 churches, it's probably seven or eight. And um, it's in the Texas Hill Country. Has anybody ever been to the Hill Country in Texas? That's beautiful. Um, sort of, legendarily so, uh, and <coughs> it's right on the edge of the desert, so it's you know, sprawling hills, live oak trees, uh, what we call rivers, and my wife um, reliably informs me are actually glorified streams, um, <laughs> but that are spring-fed and crystal clear and cold, and there's deer everywhere, which is why I was never surprised when the deer came here, except I wondered why they followed me. <laughs> and it's a very quiet, peaceful, idyllic 
place, which is not surprising. And um, I am your prototypical bookish kid. I always was. I got in trouble in school for wandering around with a book in front of my face and walking into lockers. I got in trouble for reading in class. But my parents punished me. It was uh, with being told I couldn't read. Um, and it says something about the level of the reliability my parents had and their authority, I guess, that I didn't read until I found out that I could just ask my eighth grade English teacher to assign me whatever book I felt like reading. And it, was and it wasn't getting around being grounded. So words were my first love. They're my, my all-time favorite Everything I'd say, pastime thing to do, whatever it is. So I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt. So, so why doctor? How that happened? I have four kids. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's four nights you didn't read. That's right. <laughs> You know this, Katie's like half a mile that way, and if I make any joke based on that, she'll be here in a minute. So I'm not saying anything else in response to that. Um, why, Dr. So, the truth is, I, I really wish it was a glamorous story, but the truth is I read a book when I was 12 that had a character who was a doctor. Oh, God. And who I admired, and who I decided I, um, I wanted to be like, and not to make this a very sad, soft story, but, you know, my parents... Uh, divorced when I was fairly young and separated. My mom worked a lot. There weren't a lot of great male role models in my life. And so what I found in life were in books and television um, and things like that. And I, I've spun a lot of good stories about it over the years, but the truth is there was a character. He was a doctor and he was kind of who I wanted to be. He was you know, calm and collected and smart and helpful and um, all of these things. And the other great thing about Utopia that I see so well mirrored in Shelter Island is it's so focused, it was a place that was focused on community and helping each other. And um, and in my mind, that all just clicked. Being a doctor meant that you could do all of that. You could, um, but the way, and the way you life. found your way to Shelter Island um, specifically was was through church. Was it? it More or less, yeah. So I went to this tiny liberal arts uh, church affiliated university in the church that I grew up in in central Arkansas and um, intending to be a doctor which lasted about a year until I found out that college also meant uh, you could spend time in the library you could spend time talking to pretty girls and you could spend time oversleeping and not going to class um, and so I wandered through lots of different majors until my scholarship ran out and I worked odd jobs and did this and finally said, well, I like books, I'll get a master's in English and I'll do that for a while. About that time, my younger brother went to medical school and I went to his white coat ceremony, which is your first year of medical school. They give you a white coat and all this responsibility and say, don't look at the price tag, it'll be fine. And I said, oh no, that looks good again, um, which means that nine careers is possible because apparently I'm a magpie. <laughs> so long story short, I decided to do that and uh, when it came time to figure out where to do my specialty training in family medicine, I have friends who were in Southampton. You sort of apply to a bunch of different places, this magic mythical computer algorithm that I think is made up. I think it's just one person in a room tossing confetti in the air, <laughs> but said that I was coming to Southampton and that was great. And then I said, oh no, apparently it's very expensive to live there and I still have these four kids. I haven't lost them yet. <laughs> and my best friend slash college roommate slash uh, best man at my wedding. Um, his father had been the minister at a church that um, the Clarks with the South Ferry that Cliff Clark goes to. And so one day Katie gets a phone call, my wife from Cliff Clark saying, we hear you're moving up here. We went to that same college. We'd love to help you out. And then he kept calling every week to say, do you need anything? And help us find a place to rent on Shelter Island. And somehow we ended up on Shelter Island. All right, so we're going to get back to poetry in a, in a minute. But I'm going to ask, if I may, Susan, um, what what, uh, what your sort of geography has been, because it's an interesting one. You've been here since you were a kid. Yes. Yes, I, I fell down the stairs in our, our first rented house in the Heights, and so I was probably five-ish. Um, we were always uh, suburb renters yeah. out here, and grew up in Brooklyn, 
a very, very, very large family, and my parents kept... It's, four, it's 14 kids. 14 children. Wow. <laughs> Nine boys, five girls. I've got two sisters here tonight. And um, at one point, we lived in a beautiful house up on a hill in the Heights that is, is now yours. And, uh, yeah, we're moving into Susan Perry's house. <laughs> you could have helped with the renovation. To name on the bathroom wall. <laughs> if the walls could talk. Um, <laughs> And so Shelter Island was always a, a, a great summer place, a place we loved. But uh, then as you go through these different iterations of your life, you have a chance to spend different time here. And I think more <coughs> towards the last decade, I'd say, my husband Marty and I had more time. We were empty nesters and uh, more sort of consultants than full-time yeah. working. And... Uh, if you want me to go segue into how I wound up at the I recorder. do, because I actually, but I, I wanted to ask you guys, I just wanted to move it on, but I wanted to ask you if you had in your mind writing, be, being a journalist or being a local journalist, and I wanted to ask you, Joshua, later, if you had in your mind being a poet. Um, but, and I would say that was, that was probably my original plan or, or dream. I always thought that would be great to, to, to be a journalist. I worked on the school paper and your book. But what happened when you got out of college was you just were so happy to get a job. Yeah. And one thing that did uh, appear to me to, to be a consistent thing in my toolbox was writing. So even if I was not going to be a journalist, I could explain what somebody needed to hear. Yes. A lot of the work I did would be with, with nonprofits, and being able to tell that story yes. was, was great to be able to blend those in. And at one point, uh, I helped to start a website called On Philanthropy. So we would get to interview interesting people, running nonprofits and changing the world. So I got to make make that kind of work. The um, when I when I got to the reporter place, I, I answered an ad in the reporter. Is that right? Oh, so you weren't you weren't you didn't harbor. I always thought I would own the reporter. That was actually <laughs> that was my plan. Oh, but, that. But you didn't have this thing of like I'd really like to be a writer for a well, paper. No, but I will tell you the truth. I I did get to write for the New York Times, and I thought well, that's it. I I've, I've got that's my dream. I've made it. I was so happy to get that byline. I was so happy to get that check, and then you, reality dawns, and you really. Have to be very very lucky to be so able to make a living. By, byline meaning, did you were you assigned to different? Yes, I was. I was a stringer. For, okay. they, there used to be a Long Island section of the New York yes, Times, yes. and it was great. And I was always writing about you know people who were running away from home or just you know things that got to me. And I got to write these wonderful, interesting stories. And then I began to write about how Long Island was so congested and polluted, and we said, well, if this is true, what are we doing here? <laughs> so we moved to uh, Pennsylvania for like oh, really? a long time. Oh, yeah. Really? Sorry, sorry, we're in Pennsylvania. Um, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which kind of looks like Shelter Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <coughs> then I, at some point I, I found that I had not, I thought I was on a sabbatical. I had enough, enough time to think, well, what should I do next? And I literally was reading the reporter cover to cover. I saw an ad for a proofreader. So that, I could do that. <laughs> that wasn't so long ago. That was about five years ago. So I mean, I should read the classifieds because that's why I wrote the book. There's <laughs> 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 great stuff in the in the ads. It's great stuff. So we did. I did. I did start out as a proofreader. Then uh, when COVID hit, the poor staff at the reporter and a lot of other people got furloughed. Yeah, sure. So it came down to me and our wonderful editor Ambrose Clancy. Yeah putting the paper together and I really got to kind of like do the do the thing, do the paper. And we were like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. Like, <laughs> we can do this. Let's put on a show. <laughs> and we had uh, charities here, Charity Roby and Bob Lipside, you know, some wonderful columnists. But other than that, we had to just yeah. make make the paper oh, happen. Well, well. So then I de facto became community news editor. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, uh, to tie into Finley, who's here with your books tonight. Yeah, yeah. Finley started uh, Finley's Fiction, which is so great in the Heights, and she made kind of a salon where you know writers would come and talk about their books. So I said, why don't we begin to talk about all the great writers we have here? 
and Ambrose said, okay, you can have a column called um, Island Bookshelf. Any idea I came up with, he'd be like, sure, do it, do it. And then he gave me my, my column called Shorelines, and I was able to yeah, do a, some more personal things. You know? That's wonderful. So you know, it's, 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 it's been very, I'm very, very grateful to be able to make my connection to Shelter Island work with that. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And, and so, Bill. Yes. That was an attentive answer. Thank you very much. It's a very responsive answer. I was listening to her. <laughs> so, so, when you were in Arkansas, yes, and your dad was an auctioneer around the country, he was yeah. itinerant and in Atlantic City, and then you were um, sort of Jewish dirty dancing, which was intended to be Jewish. Yeah, my the divorce belt. Yeah, my and your actually sister actually my married, married into the royalty. Married into the divorce belt. So her sister, his sister, married uh, divorce belt royalty, a grocer. Which is really like marrying. You know, it was a dad. <laughs> but but did you um, did you think you wanted to be a, a, a comedy writer? All I knew was I didn't want to be in my father's business. I would have become anything. My father ended up owning an auction gallery in Atlantic City, and it, but our lives were. He was like itinerant. I mean, I I went to eight schools before I got to high school. We were, lived in everywhere. And I just knew I didn't want to do that. And uh, then when my, my, I, I didn't really have any ambition that I could think about what I was doing. I thought I'd go into advertising. And then when my sister married Paul Grossinger, I spent the summers working up there. Oh, yeah, for about four years. And uh, they, had these incredible shows and they had young writers working for them. In fact, Mel Brooks was hired in 1949, I guess it was, 50, to write the show for the staff. Every year they would have a staff Is show. Is that right? Yeah. They have Is a staff that show. right? Yeah. Come and on. Mel was hired to do that. And as part of his deal, he said, I want to do stand-up, and Wednesday nights was a show night there with not big stars. This is at Grossinger's? Yeah. And, and so they had kind of second-class acts on Wednesday night. I mean, the week was really interesting. It was basketball on Friday, the big show on Saturday, a medium show on Wednesday, game night on Tuesday. I mean, it was just program so that nobody ever had a moment to yeah. sit still so they could work up an appetite for the food, <laughs> which never ended but at any rate mel uh talked him into letting him do stand up and he got up and he did a thing that was insulting to everybody. <laughs> I mean, he said, there's more furs on the Jews here than there are. And he just, everything that came out of his mouth, people were screaming, and so he was let go the next day. <laughs> oh, so he wasn't in residence, he was driving up. No, he was there writing this show, but he wanted this extra thing to do, so they let him loose. <laughs> and they got rid of him. <laughs> and when I met him years later working, and I said, I saw you at Grow Singers. He said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, so anyway, when I was up there, I, I kind of got interested in, in, in comedy. And then when I went to college, uh, I started to do impressions, which everybody did, you know, Mello Lugosi and it's a, and I used to do it at the fraternity house, and then I did it at nightclubs. I had a little nightclub act, and then I started putting jokes in with it, and I had a friend who, threw, who went to school with me, and we started working together. And uh, after college, we came to New York, and uh, we tried writing, you, you know, anything. I, I, I had a job uh, at uh, WNEW Radio, for $35 a week. And it was 
in an ad in the paper, and it it was for the continuity director, an assistant to the continuity director. You too classifies. Huh? Classifies. No, it was. The thing is, but the, you didn't get the job. To the oh, classifieds. it was in the classifieds yeah, at the yeah. times, yeah. and I got it at one of the Forty Second Street theaters between shows because everybody who was out of work they used to have old triple features on Forty Second Street. Anyway, I had no idea what continuity was. And this guy said, "Okay, I'm going to go to lunch, and I want you to write me a jingle and a commercial." and a public interest story and he left me there and i had no idea how to do any of it and i forced my way through he came back and he read it he said this is this is good you got the job then he got a phone call from the guy he had lunch with offering him the job he was interviewed for so I became the head of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> and, and still had no idea. I didn't get a raise. I just became, I had a title. I'm the head of the conference. And so I had to hire somebody. And I hired my, I hired Sam Denoff, yeah. who had been the, these are going back to things people don't even know about. He was the bargain broadcaster at uh, Klein's department store. What does that mean, Barton? Well, Barton's he would go on the line and say, ladies, hear this. I mean, <laughs> there are nylons galore. <laughs> and get there, don't hurt one another. <laughs> they're on the sixth floor. And he, would, he was funny. And then he was there about three weeks. And then he did a thing. He said, ladies, this is a big one. There is a truckload of brassiers on the ninth floor. This is a bust out sale. So he was fired. And uh, I, I hired him. And we started, I had started writing little jokes. The continuity department meant that there was a book for each disc jockey show. Do this commercial, do the weather, traffic report. It was, a, it was like a, putting together a book. It was the most tedious thing in the world. And that was back in the days of, of uh, what were they called? They didn't have uh, anything. They Who's had the purple. Purple. They printed purple. It was. Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo. Vimeo was already a step up in English. <laughs> I had purple hands for five years because you put this the, the paper on a drum and the carbon in it was purple, so, which when you type, so you put this solution in that took the purple and put it on the page and your hands. So I walked around with purple hands. Anyway, started writing little jokes for the disc jockeys and the owner of the station said, that's fun, keep doing that, you know? And so uh, then we had a Christmas show and a, a Christmas party and Sam and I wrote a show, full musical. This is, sorry, is this still NEW? Yeah, is this was right? in, in five, four years later. and. We wrote this show and we performed it. And afterwards, this little guy came up to us and said, hi, my name is George Shapiro. I'm at the Morris office and I would like to be your agent. And I never even dreamed that we'd have an agent. And we said, well, great, uh, can I have a card? He said, well, I don't, I don't have them yet because until today I was in the mail room. <laughs> I don't care if you don't have cards and you're still in the mail. We got an agent. And so George Shapiro went on to discover Jerry Chant, Seinfeld, Andy Kaufman, uh, George uh, Carlin. He was the best manager in the whole world. And uh, so we were very lucky. And, and he would go up to, we wrote for comedians in, who were in nightclubs. Like the first job we got was for a guy named Jimmy Casanova. 
And we said to him after we met, we have a great routine on your name. And he said, what's funny about Jimmy? <laughs> and that's why you've never heard of it. <laughs> and the first paycheck we ever got was a check for six hundred and fifty dollars, five hundred, excuse me, five hundred and fifty dollars, because we wrote him five minutes, and he had a check from an insurance company for an accident he had in a revolving door at <laughs> and it was for five hundred and fifty dollars. So he endorsed the check, but we had to give him fifty dollars. I mean, that's anyway. Things went on, and George went to California, and uh, we wrote for countless people. I mean, Steve Allen was the first big job we have, and 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 we were there. Our contract was for three weeks. And then a pickup for three weeks, and another pickup for three weeks, and another pickup for three weeks. It was like, but we figured we'd only chance we'd ever get. So we quit our jobs at WNEW, and we went. And the first thing that happened is my wife was pregnant. So now I got no future. And, and it turned out that at the third week before the pickup, we wrote one joke that Steve Allen laughed for about a half hour. He, Steve <laughs> cackled when he, he would go berserk over certain kinds of silly things. So he liked the joke so much that he picked us up for the whole season. And the next week, the show was canceled. So, <laughs> so we got 26 weeks worth of pay, and that allowed us to, to stay there. Oh, wow. and, uh, so, so we're going to get back to the, we're going to get back to, the, I'm going to move it along. Because I want to no, get back no, to Listen, the, I'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, we're going to get back. I just want to uh, advance everyone's little chapter, if I may. And so we're going to get back because we have to hear about the Dick Van Dyke Show and that girl and Mary Tyler Moore. Um, you know, I, um, I hope this is okay. I um, had a few things that each of you wrote. And I, I wanted to, before I ask you, Dr. Potter, I can't call you anything other than Dr. Potter. I'm going to stand here to read it. Um, because, uh, sorry for the hard segment, but we're going to come back to California and... Hey, I got nowhere to go. <laughs> so, 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 so Dr. Joshua Potter is on 114 in treating <clears throat> COVID and sciatica and psychological things. And little did I know, he's writing all his life. Is that true? All his life. And I'm, I'm a poetry fan and, um, and an admirer particularly of the two-time poet laureate Billy Collins. And I think Bill also is a huge <coughs> Joshua Potter poetry fan, and I just brought along one Joshua Pottery Potter Pottery Barn Pottery Barn poetry that's on sale, and uh, I end up the Pottery Barn catalog. I'll take <laughs> so, um, I, did, would you rather read it, or would you rather I? It is entirely up to you. Uh oh, shit. Uh, you know, would you mind? Yeah, I think he should read it. Yeah, I just I love it so read. much. <laughs> Would you mind? No. Great, thank you. Do I have to stand over there? Yeah, I'd love okay. it. It'd be good. I really thought you were going to say no. I should have just, just said Sit down for a while. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is called Nothing. It's auspicious, right? This is actually the first... I think the first poem I shared with you and Bill. Um, so that's interesting. Right. Nothing is so daunting to me as a mountain of laundry that waits on my kitchen table, a pitiless pile of repetition, today, tomorrow, every day, for as long as I live. I can pay the bills, shop for bags of cracked, dry carrots, and sad spinach that my daughters will not eat. I can face the demons of my office email, but the laundry wears me down utterly. And so it grows, favored child of entropy, the undone chore, until there is nothing left in the world except for me, sitting on the edge, on the couch 
across from the looming cheerleading skirts and baseball jerseys and blue scrubs from my last night shift at the hospital, recalling when I held a woman's wasted hands as the light escaped her empty eyes. Beautiful. So just a question or two about poetry. So you began writing at what age? Poetry specifically? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. I've been writing as long as I can remember. Yeah. Um, which sounds like one of those lines that people who want to be writers say, right? Um, no, writing is, is the only thing I've always done. Really? Consistently. Um, and poetry is the probably the first thing I wrote. My seemed to be bleeding slightly if I was only a doctor. <laughs> um, my mother likes to remind me that she has all of my poetry from when I was a teenager hidden away somewhere for blackmail, which is good because it's terrible. And I kept doing it. I never stopped. Um, once I got a cell phone and the lovely notes app for the last 10 years, I've just been scribbling things away in there. And oh, um, hell of a doctor. So <laughs> I didn't say I was a great doctor. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know what I think. Part of it with poetry is obviously I have a short attention span. If we're going to listen to Bill about my careers, um, but I got introduced to it early. I got introduced to to Yates in particular. It's always was an early deep love of mine, and. I'm also a very, um, music matters a lot to me, and songwriters. But they don't, don't feel self-conscious that Loudon Weinreich III is here listening. Yeah, I tried not to. Poetry. Didn't even notice. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, and a lot of the greatest lyrics in music are obviously poetry, and, and it all just blended in my head, and, and so I, um, that's just what I always did. but in the late 20th and early 21st century. If you were a poor kid in Southwest Texas, nobody said, hey, be a poet, that's a great career option. <laughs> um, literally nobody ever said that to me in my life. <laughs> I will say though that we, I had a, a friend and a, and a mentor for a brief time um, in San Antonio, a guy by the name of Bryce Milligan. If you Google him, there has turned out to be a bit of a scandal since, but Bryce was a very well-known poet. He um, owned and operated the uh, oldest independent printing press in, in Texas. Um, I think he uh, was one of the first people to publish Sandra de Cisneros um, out of San Antonio. Um, and Sandra de Cisneros, it was in my mind today. I just mixed up Sandra de Ocon. Anyways. Um, just don't say Ralph Delorean. Don't say Ralph Cisneros. Delorean. That's no. And Bryce, um, is a great poet himself, and he, when I was 19, read some poems of mine and said, you're not bad, find your own voice, yeah. and then stopped answering my emails because he was busy. And that was 20 years ago, and so I kept going, and just, uh, I wish there was something more to it beyond, it's what made sense in my head. I've written a lot of things over the years, but that's what I always came back to. And, and if I may, I'll just brag, like you're a son, but you did just get recognition for your poetry. A little, yes, I did. I was very fortunate here. This is the scene of the crime um, to to get an honorable mention in the um, the Bliss Morehead Poetry Grant contest here. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, so, Susan, uh, um, do you want to read? I just have a couple of excerpts, mm -hmm. an excerpt from something you wrote during you COVID. Can read it. Yeah, um, um, it's it's. This is from an, an article in The Reporter, so it's just journalism, and it's lovely. The full, art the full article is oodles times better than what I'm going to read, really. But it was, it's just so rare. I opened the shelter on The Reporter, and there's a reflection on July 4th that uh, sort of almost brings me to tears. Uh, and it's there in the local paper, it's so pretty. And so this is not gonna be well read and it's 
truncated and excerpted, but it says the holiday would include flag raising. Definitely all of us. I was one of a family of 14. Dressed in red, white, and blue, we continued into adulthood. The more colorful, the better. When we were children, my father had bought an old Cadillac convertible and had it painted red, white, and blue for his congressional campaigns. Fireworks meant a bunch of us kids all over the open car as the fireworks burst overhead. I'm sure that's just a faulty memory that suggests we had cinders falling on us from the sky. And then she talks about being on a boat and watching the harbor illuminate with all the boats waiting for the fireworks in, in the harbor and says the sky turns from blue to blue black and the shore becomes graceful, curving silhouettes <coughs> when darkness arrives and the pyrotechnics begin. We count ourselves lucky to be part of this magical place. And uh, so it's almost July 4th again, so it's a beautiful. <laughs> I think everybody can relate to that. We all know how beautiful it is. Yeah. yeah. So when 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 you write like that, it's not quite New York Times journalism. I I remember being very very nervous when I would write for the New York Times. You know, you feel like you can ha you have to stay within the the margins and you can't be creative. Not certainly in my role. You know. Um, yeah. So. That probably is part of getting to uh, your third act where you have that freedom, you feel like you can express yourself. I certainly have the support, again, of Ambrose, my yes. editor, uh, who says, just, just go with it. And it does, you know, writers say, you know, I hate writing, but I, I love having written. It yes. does make you feel good when you say, I got out what I wanted to say. I'm gonna ask you a dumb interview question. Is it the most professionally satisfying thing you've done? I have to say, yes, there's a completeness about it. Um, there are things you try to do over the years and you most of us run into frustration in our work or don't quite do what we set out to do. And I feel like there's, there's so much that you can do because it's the other side of the coin of the small staff, but we have so, so many opportunities to just express ourselves. Certainly the column lets me do that, but even writing a story, I can kind of give it a, a, a nice little twist if, uh, if it fits. So there's a, there is a lot of satisfaction there. And, and please keep reading your local newspapers, it's so important. Yes. Oh, plus I want to say the, the other piece of it is, you know, you're writing uh, for the newspaper, but now we've gotten into the digital age and the, Josh and I connected doing a podcast. And so we're, we're keeping up and, and moving to the future. And that's very different because it's not scripted, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It's wonderful. It's great. So I have one more thing, if you don't mind, and then we'll talk about <clears throat> how you guys go through transitions in life and what well, me? anybody yeah. and what you may think of. But um, I asked Bill, uh, I said to Bill on email, uh, gee, I'm gonna, we're doing this thing tonight. Can you send me something I can read? And so this is what I got. Would you like to read it or would you prefer? Yeah. Right. You would good. No, I don't, no, I'd love if you would. Let's take a vote, him or me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I truncated this a little bit. Uh, you have to hold the mic to your. I think, oh God, sorry. yes, I sorry. Forgot. Just when you thought you were ready to the title, the title, oh, the title is called "A New Career at the Age of 75. Just when you thought you were ready to retire, you're actually starting a new career as a maintenance man. America's fastest growing occupation. So here are some tips on entering the field. The average maintenance man is on at least two of the following. A statin for cholesterol, something for arthritis, higher low blood pressure, back, his eyes, digestion, and prostate, all to be taken with a full glass of water 
making 8 p.m. the end of the safety zone for those with prostate. Add something to sleep at bedtime and you are creating a perfect storm. Doctor visits are a big part of your new career. Since there is now a specialist for each of the body's 289 moving parts, so your primary care doctor is more of a travel agent. <laughs> Exercise is important, but don't waste time remembering how good you used to be. That also applies to sex. <laughs> the family pet you had since he was a pup or a kitten has aged right along with you. Do whatever it takes to keep him going, because given the opportunity, he'd do the same for you. <laughs> Most important, as you enter the next phase of your life, be sure to maintain a sense of humor. Yeah. So we have uh, we have to watch the clock. It's almost five of eight, and people have appointments. So um, I'll, I'll, we didn't get to um, Carl Reiner at all, well, or or Dick Van Dyke, or Mary Tyler Moore, or that girl. Incidentally, the Mary Tyler Moore Doctor. show that's on tonight is, is unbelievable. Is it good? Yes. And he's in it. I'm, I'm, well, oh. I'm in it, but it's just a really good, is it really? it's really a high okay. class look at Mary, who was a very, very dear and close friend. And I would, would say that, you know, uh, I wrote that when I was 75, and I am not really in Act 3, I am in episode six of a Netflix series that I'm going to pick up. And, uh, I, it, it's, uh, most of my time now that I spend in, from my career and from my experiences as a mentor to writers yes. and young comedians. And one of the most uh, satisfying is the writing program that they have at Sloan Kettering Memorial for the cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And they all write, there's a book that we publish, and I mentor 25 writers, adding new ones and unfortunately losing old ones. Uh, but that's what I do mostly. And uh, at my age, I'm 91 now. And uh, there's not a lot of professional work waiting. <laughs> so can I ask you, I'm going to ask you guys one last question and then we're going to say, uh, um, just for those of us like me who are interested in transitions, other than the classifieds, <laughs> what would you say about coming to a time when you might, one might, want to consider doing something different than they did? Any thoughts about it? I, I do have a thought about um, Shelter Island being a, a very good place for that because people, many people here wear several hats and don't fit into one little box. And the um, sometimes you can get into something new by volunteering and that certainly is something that's very, very well received and very uh, uh, common here. So uh, I think that this is really a place that, yeah. that, that should, everybody should, should consider what's in your book because you and I talked about what the key is to people doing that third act yeah. and it was engaging. Yeah, it yeah. was something that makes you feel like you're going to make really good use of this time, whatever it is. And yeah. I've been doing a series on people living to 100 in Shelter Island. Have so, you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of them. So this is a good place to continue yeah. your your uh, many, many acts. Great. Well, thank you. Joshua, uh, you... I think a lot of it is uh, nice that we have the opportunity, right? Here's my pitch for modern medicine, that we are living longer and healthier often, although not always by any stretch. Um, and there was a lot of engagement in the book that you wrote. There's also some opportunities for people to say, oh, this is always a thing I wanted to do and want to get back to. And the world has more mobility and the world has more opportunities thanks to, thanks to technology and all everything. And um, 
you know, that's that's my opportunities that have come along the way is that plus people that I met who encouraged me to do different things who said, yeah, you know, you're 28. That's not really that old. You can go be a doctor still. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, good. Um, <laughs> people who, like you and, and Bill and other people I know who said, oh, you, you write some things? Let me read them. And then, um, you know, either because you wanted the doctor's office to pick up the phone when you call or <laughs> I mean, think good things said, this isn't bad, you know, keep, keep plugging away. And, and um, it's very cliche that passion matters and doing things that remind us of who we are and what brings joy and passion to life is a good thing. And third acts are opportunities for people sometimes to get back to that or come to it for the first time. And... Um, that plus the relationships that we're lucky to have, maybe um, oh, it's a beautiful bit of alchemy that makes it happen. You know, there are so many people that I know personally sitting here, and I, I, I can't be comprehensive about those who were accountants and then become lay chaplains, those who are archaeologists and then become painters, uh, successful painters, and those who do things that are entirely surprising. If one were to know them, which I do, a few and, and they're, uh, it's sort of stunning. Um, the possibility is stunning. It's just stunning. Um, that's not much of a contribution. It's just stunning. And Bill? Well, I, I think that for me, and increasingly, and especially as I lose my independence and, and you know, all the youthful stuff. The thing I think that's most important is to remain relevant. That it really matters to other people that you're still here. And, uh, you know, you, you, you are part of a group and then the groups, you, you get sick or so and so, and the group checks in and <coughs> sees how you are. But it's very hard to maintain being something or being proud of yourself or feeling that you really matter. So for me, being relevant and, and it, 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 the, I, I couldn't think of anything else to do but to impart what I knew how to do to younger people. So I taught and uh, I do guests on a lot of podcasts. I'm available. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, I'll be calling. And, uh, and it's just rewarding to, and the thing at Sloan Kettering is, is, is really amazing to have people who are going through hell. And they, they asked me if I would do a, 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 an evening of how to put humor into sad things which was quite a challenge. And, and uh, I did a, 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 a television, I mean, we did a televised with Alan Zweibel, who is one of the original writers on, on uh, Saturday Night Live and very popular, and Adriana Trujani, who is an amazing novelist. And we did a conversation about how to find humor when you're you know you're dying or you, that you're suffering and uh it was really a it meant a lot to the, to the, to the patients and everybody then said i'm going to try and write something funny about dying i said okay take a shot you know and uh so i gave back in terms of what i knew and you know, I became a mentor and I yeah. talked about writing. And with young people in particular in schools where I, where I speak a lot, it's television classes, they have no idea of the business that they are in. It's, and you know, I, I say to them, you're on the 11th floor of a building and you don't know what's holding it up. And uh, so I introduced people to classic stuff that's been done and it, it kind of enriches their life and makes them feel better. Yes. 
Well, thank you. So I, I'd like to thank uh, everybody at the library for allowing me to come here and have this conversation. It's a treat for me, and I'd like to thank Susan and Joshua and, and, and Bill, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on a Friday night when it's so nice outside. <laughs> and you're in the basement. And so, so I think we're all grateful. I'm particularly grateful for spending your uh, <clears throat> Memorial Day Eve in the basement.